Hello and welcome to the Consistency Project Podcast. My name is Patrick Cummings. As always, I'm here with E.C. Sinkowski. Every week on the show, we aim to simplify the science of nutrition, health, and fitness, cutting through the noise to focus on the principles and practices that will help you perform better, feel better, and live better. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. Hello. How are you, E.C.? Great. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. You know what just popped into my head? I was mm. I was reading comments on YouTube, which really not mm. a good idea, but I was reading them on one of our episodes I forget which one. And somebody said, <laughs> it made me laugh. And somebody said, the only thing worse than intros are long intros. Mm. And I was like, okay, I kind of understand that. But I just looked, that intro was 20 seconds long. <laughs> I don't know. Where... <laughs> I saw um... that as well. And I was like, I guess this person has not learned the technology of skimming, if that really bothers <laughs> right. them. But... That's right. The skip 15 seconds or whatever it is. So anyways, shout out to that guy for not being patient enough. <laughs> Thanks to for letting us seconds. know. <laughs> yeah. All right. This week, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to turn a critical eye onto a recent position paper on the nutritional needs of female athletes, looking specifically at the paper's recommendations on pre- and post-workout carbohydrate and protein intake. Mm -hmm. Doing a deep dive here. Mm -hmm. What is this paper? And mm -hmm. maybe give us a sense of the background and maybe even like, why, why this? Like, mm -hmm. why are we going to spend the time talking about this one? Of all the papers yeah. we could talk about. This is not a completely new topic for mm -hmm. us. But um, yeah, so there's this International Society of Sports Nutrition Position Stand paper that came out last year, and it's the Nutritional Concerns of the Female Athlete. Now, just some background, the International Society of Sports Nutrition, or the ISSN, is a nonprofit academic society dedicated to promoting the science and application of evidence-based sports nutrition and supplementation. And their position stand papers are really meant to reflect the scientific consensus of topics of interest to, you know, of course, the readers in their community. And so this one came out again last year related to the female athlete. And Stacey Sims is the lead author. There are about 20 almost other co-authors in addition to Sims being the lead author. And I've certainly gotten a number of questions about Sims's recommendations. So I thought this was a great opportunity to get into the weeds of the evidence specifically related to, as you said, the carb and, and protein intakes based on sex or age or timing, even relative to workouts. You know, we've talked about this before. As I mentioned, we even talked about it pretty recently with the interview with Alan Aragon. Mm -hmm. And that is, in my opinion, the lack of evidence for sex-specific recommendations. But certainly, again, this gives us the opportunity to do that. Now, I do want to be clear. I, I don't disagree with everything in the paper. There's stuff in there that's totally fine. There's stuff that says women need to eat enough calories and carbs to fuel their training. Yep. Now, I would say the same thing is true for men, but okay. Mm -hmm. There's other points like if you have multiple sessions or super high volume, you're going to need to replenish the muscle glycogen or the carbohydrates. And we talked about that in our nutrient timing podcast, but I would say the same thing is true for men. There are also points like women have GI issues during certain times of their cycle. And so they might have to kind of strategize fueling for an endurance events, especially when they're over 60 minutes in light of that. Now, of course, I wouldn't say that directly to men, but I'm going to tell you that some men are going to have some GI issues unrelated to cycle in terms of fueling. And so these just become logistical considerations that we have to make in light of the individual's context. So again, overall, there are some pieces in here that I agree with. I just wanted to tackle the ones that I feel are potentially at odds with my recommendations, because again, that's where I get a lot of the questions. Got it. Um, context question. Yeah. It's uh, regarding or thinking about or looking at athletes specifically. Mm -hmm. And is that what we're mm -hmm. going to talk about? And maybe even where does a where does an individual listening to this? Mm -hmm. Am I an athlete or am I a recreational exerciser? Like, is there any distinction made? Do we need to make any distinction going forward for this conversation? I don't think so for our purposes, certainly in the paper, how you would interpret certain recommendations, I think will depend on where you fall on that scale. For example, when they were talking about carbohydrate fueling, and they talk about multiple sessions per day or exhaustive efforts, I just don't have a lot of clients that fall in that. And given the fact that most people aren't exercising enough. I think most people listening don't fall in that, although we have quite an active listener population, right? So I think it's going to be based on kind of what are the performance demands. But for this conversation, I don't think that people need to make that distinction above and beyond the fact that they're probably have some sort of regular exercise in their current routine. Got it. Okay, cool. All right. So you sent me kind of the four big topics that we wanted to tackle in this episode. And those four topics, pre-workout carb intake, post-workout carb intake, total protein intake, and pre and post-workout protein intake. So let us, as we do, start with the first one, pre-workout carb intake. 
Yeah. So there's this recommendation to have about 30 grams of carbs before your workout, especially if it's more of a cardio session instead of a strength session. Now, truth be told, that recommendation wasn't a key recommendation in the paper, meaning it wasn't kind of in the summary bullet points of takeaways, but it was discussed in the paper. And I also saw that recommendation repeated in a very recent CNN news article that interviews Sims, where she said, okay, before kind of cardiovascular workouts have 30 grams of carbohydrates. So I thought it was legitimate enough to kind of take a deeper dive. Now we're going to put again in the show notes, our podcast on how to fuel performance and nutrient timing for performance and mass. So you can get my full nuanced opinion, all of that stuff. But again, so long as people are eating the right total quantity of food and working out once a day, in my opinion, I don't give this extra recommendation of 30 grams of carbs pre-workout. Okay, so then it becomes a matter of let's dive into the paper and see what the evidence is. So on page 403 in their paper, quote, during sustained high intensity sports lasting approximately one hour, small amounts of pre-exercise carbohydrate, about 30 grams, enhance performance, end quote. Now, thankfully, this sentence came with a reference. So on to the reference I went, mm -hmm. and that was a study from 2014 of 11 women, 11, pretty small sample size to yep. make really broad recommendations, but okay, nevertheless, it's like, it's what like happened? like one CrossFit class at 6.30 <laughs> in the morning. Okay, that's fine. So let's see what happened. So these women took a combination of either caffeine or carbs or by themselves or placebo before this experiment that had them do an agility test, followed by 10 cycles of very short sprints on a bike, like five by four seconds, which is really short and high intense stuff with rest in between. And then they do another ag agility test at the end of all of that. So the results are there was no difference, no difference in performance for the agility test regardless if they had carbs or not, caffeine or not, placebo or not. Okay. Then in two of the 10 sprint cycles, two of the 10, the groups that had carbs did slightly better in power or work completed. The key here is slightly better. We're talking like 1%. And again, it wasn't all 10 cycles. It was two of the 10 cycles. And then again, the agility test had no difference. So taking that all in, in context of also it only being 11 women, I'm just sort of thinking, wait, this is the evidence for me to then make this a really broad recommendation that people should be having 30 car grams of carbs pre-workout, especially considering all of the other references and context that I went through in those other podcasts that people can go back and take a listen to that. So for me, it's not strong enough that people need this to see, quote, performance bumps like this that I would argue are not really clinically relevant. And so again, it comes back to me only wanting to make recommendations that I really think are going to pay off for people, mm. not making recommendations that I think maybe enhance some people sometimes in some ways. Interesting. And we've definitely talked about that, that last bit, but maybe worth saying, like, why, why not? Like why, why mm -hmm. and it's something that you do very consistently and very well. You're a stickler for like, the evidence isn't there for that, for me to recommend mm -hmm. this. Even if some people mm -hmm. might say like, Hey, this could help you. Quickly, why, why do you sort of hold the line where you do so often across, you know, whether we're talking about this stuff or any, you know, name any supplement or any other thing? Yeah. In other people's opinions, defense, maybe it's by way of my marketing. I am continuously getting clients who their current nutrition plan is not sustainable and they don't have the goals they want. So in my opinion, to make something more sustainable, we have to reduce the rules. Mm. We have to, I think you've described them as constraints before. Yep. We have to have the minimal amount of rules because life is too unpredictable and has too many different demands on it that if our nutrition has so many demands on it, we're not gonna be able to stick to this gosh darn thing. And so maybe it's a biased collection of clients I get, but I find that when we have all of these theoretical maybes, then people will miss all these targets as well. Shoot, I didn't get my carbs in before the workout, so I might as well not work out. Like, oh gosh, no, that's not <laughs> that's not how it works, right? Mm. So it's really about making this sustainable for people while also getting the results. Love it. Okay, second one that we want to hit on is recommendations for post-workout carb intake. Yeah, and this section, I really don't have a ton of disagreements with their key recommendations. Again, they talk about the necessity of replacing carbs to optimize performance, especially with high volume or multiple sessions, go back to our how to fuel uh, performance podcast for all of that. So 
I, I don't really have a ton of disagreements in this section, but one of their key recommendations, this is from page 405, quote, peri and postmenopausal women should focus on rapid consumption of carbohydrate per the above with close consideration to nutri nutrient timing to maximize glycogen recovery, end quote. So I pulled this quote because I think it could be very easily misinterpreted to mean, oh, I need to have carbs post-workout when I'm peri or postmenopausal. But no, the sentence says the purpose of that carbs post-workout is to maximize glycogen recovery. Mm. That's not the goals my clients have. The goals my clients have are to lose weight or improve performance. Simply filling up your muscle glycogen faster does not predict or guarantee those outcomes. It simply means your glycogen is refilled at a faster rate. It does not mean you won't be able to fill your muscle glycogen at a slower rate. You will. You will still be able to fill up your muscle glycogen over the next 24 hours before your next workout. So I think this is a great example of sentences that can be misinterpreted due to the science speak, you know, maximizing glycogen recovery. And it sounds like a really necessary thing. And it is in the sense that we need to have it happen by your workout tomorrow, but we don't need to have it happen within one hour again for our once a day exercise people. So if it is necessary for body comp, uh, muscle mass gains, performance, I'm all ears. But we, my clients are not interested in just refilling muscle glycogen at a faster rate. So in my opinion, this is irrelevant for most people. Got it. All right. The third one, total protein intake. What recommendations in the paper do you disagree with? So I think our listeners know my baseline recommendation is for that 0.7 grams per pound of protein. So 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Now, I like to remind listeners that I do recommend up to the one gram per pound, but that's really for individuals who are doing a lot of heavy resistance training, very muscular, or potentially the fact that they really do love eating protein because then we're going to give a nod to sustainability there. Yep. So I want to be clear. I don't think one gram per pound is harmful. I just think that people don't see how this can hamstrung their goals because more protein means more calories and go ahead and check out our recent five macro myths podcast for more on that, that we'll link in the show notes. So the key, one of the key recommendations on page 408 of this paper is basically saying that all women should eat 1.8 grams to 2.2 grams of protein per kilogram body weight per day. So with all of these scientific studies, we have to do this conversion between grams mm -hmm. per kilogram to grams per pound. So this is saying that women should eat 0.8 to 1 grams per pound. So first of all, that's not wildly different than what I say, right? But again, in this recent CNN article, Sims is quoted as saying that women in general should have one grams per pound of uh, protein per day. So I was like, okay, she definitely is kind of steering people towards this one gram per pound as the default. So I want to go back into the protein sections of this paper and really look for the evidence. Where does it say that? So on page 406, this paper cites a 2020 study that looked at protein intakes across different athletes and they looked at endurance athletes, they looked at resistance exercise, they looked at intermittent exercise, again, for females, and they found that protein intakes ranged from 1.28 up to 1.63 grams per kilogram body weight. So this is up to 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight, and again, 1.6 grams per kilogram is the same as my 0.7 grams per pound. Okay, so that was one reference, and I'm like, okay, that's not convincing evidence that I have to move up from my baseline at 0.7. Moving on, another quote in on page 406, quote, as also commonly observed and recommended in males, high protein diets greater than two grams per kilogram per day, coupled with heavy resistance training, have been shown to be important for maintaining lean mass and resting energy expenditure, that's the number of calories burned per day, under periods of intentional or unintentional caloric restriction, end quote. Okay, that's a long sentence that's basically saying, okay, if you're doing heavy resistance training and there is a caloric deficit, whether you mean to or not, you want your protein to be greater than two grams per kilogram per day to maintain your lean mass. Okay, two grams per kilogram per day is about 0.9 grams per pound, which is higher than my baseline. Now, the good news here is that statement comes with two references that I could look into and be like, hey, what do they find in those two references? Well, the first one recommends 1.6 grams per kilogram, <laughs> which is my 0.7. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not really strong evidence. 
The second one was a review article looking at 20 different studies of caloric deficits and what happens to um, protein synthesis or muscle mass. Now, only 12 of those 20 studies looked at women. So if we're going to be talking, we have all this evidence for women. We're only going to look at those 12. But then within those 12, only two actually measured muscle mass changes instead of just looking at biomarkers, which, again, don't interest me that much. So what did those two studies find? Well, the first one found that 1.6 grams per kilogram, which is the same as my 0.7, again, preserved more lean mass and lost more fat mass than a higher protein intake at 2.4 grams per kilogram or 1.1 grams per pound. Okay, so again, more evidence that my 0.7 is at least adequate, if not better. And then the second study in this uh, roundup found that 1.3 grams per kilogram, which is about 0.6 grams per pound in premenopausal overweight women resulted in more favorable body composition changes than lower protein t- intake. So the point here is, again, I know that was a lot of numbers, but the cited references do not support the claim that women need this 0.9 grams per pound, let alone one grams per pound. And in fact, even suggest more so (laughs) that people should be doing something close to a 0.7 grams per pound. Okay, one more thing on this protein intake, because I get asked this a bunch, so I'm I'm hammering some of the the facts in the paper here. This is from page 407, quote, perimenopausal and postmenopausal athletes will need to consider daily protein intake at the mid to higher range, 1.8 to 2 grams per kilogram per day of recommendations due to the decline in estradiol and the ensuing insulin and anabolic resistance coupled with demands of physical activity. Good news. This is also a sentence with three different citations. So off to the citations I go. The first one does not look at protein intake at all, so irrelevant. The second one, the highest protein intake recommended in the paper is 1.3 grams per kilogram, which is the same as 0.6 grams per pound. And the third one cites an intake of 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram, which is 0.55 to 0.7 grams per pound. Okay, (laughs) so again, kind of pointing towards 0.7 grams per pound is a pretty good place to be. And I really couldn't find in the whole paper any other sentences or references that would really suggest women need to be at this one gram per pound level. And look, I'm open to being wrong. So if you have the evidence of original research studies in PubMed giving women one gram per pound that show better muscle mass, performance, or weight loss than a 0.7, please send it my way. But even this position stand paper The references, when I go to look them up, gives me more fodder for 0.7 grams per pound than one gram per pound. How does that, like, I'm confused as to how that happens. Like, how does, how, (laughs) it's a layman's question, but like. Got me. I think you said there's like 20 authors in this and 20 of them said, okay, this, that's the citation for this, this, and that. And then mm-hmm. you go and read, and none of the citations say the thing that the text, like, I can't imagine it's 20 people saying, hey, nobody's actually going to check this, let's lie, mm-hmm. May- because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not cynical. So, like, is it, yeah. I'm just confused by that. Like, I don't know how that happens. Yeah, I don't know either. I, I do know that some of this takes time. Mm-hmm. So I would be shocked if all 20 authors went down the rabbit hole to look up these references and look up the studies to do so. So there's that. I also know that the body is incredibly resilient Mm -hmm. and there have been studies of people eating more than one one gram per pound and they're fine. And so my point isn't to say that nobody should be eating one gram per pound. My nuance here is the necessity of it for the goals that people want, I do not think is there. And so all in all, if they want to recommend a higher protein intake, even if the evidence isn't there, I'm not even that against it per se, because I don't think it's harmful, but I just don't think it's sustainable. And therefore, you know, again, I don't say it. So how does that happen? Back to your original question. I honestly don't know. There was more than one time during this, I double and triple checked the paper and the reference to make sure that I was looking at the right thing. And sometimes I'm like, am I crazy Mm. here? Because this is not what this says at all. But, you know, again, people can look up these references and see what I saw and they can send me the evidence that I'm asking for and I'll change my mind. Last one we had on our list, uh, pre and post workout protein intake. Yeah, so this one we've talked about a bunch and the recommendations about pre and post workout really come down to this notion that it's necessary to maximize MPS or muscle protein synthesis. And 
I don't want to go into too much detail here, but just for the context, again, briefly, muscle protein th synthesis or MPS is the process of making more muscle. And yes, it will go up after you eat protein. And yes, it will go up after you do resistance training. But whether that actually results in more like obvious muscle on your body comes down to the balance between MPS and MPB, which is the muscle protein breakdown that's also occurring, as well as, of course, your training intensity and volume. And where we have evidence of muscle mass gains and performance gains is when we focus on the total quantity of protein in our diet, plus, of course, our exercise regime, not necessarily these MPS rates post-workout. And we talked about that quite recently due to a 2023 study that sort of blew the doors off this notion that we all need these perfect 30 grams of protein intakes to maximize MPS anyway. So I don't want to go back through that, all of that, although we just did a little bit. We have to get to this sort of point of agreement. You either believe in chasing maximum MPS for the non-professional athlete for these theoretical maybes, or you believe that total protein intake with the right total diet and the requisite exercise program is what you want to chase. Of course, I believe in the latter. So that's kind of a premise to understand all of this. And I do think that these authors are suggesting, you know, to really focus on the MPS rates as though that's going to pay off, which I don't agree we see necessarily in the literature. And so just to pull on a couple quotes here, the first is from page 408 in the key recommendations, quote, premenopausal eumenorrheic and oral contraceptive using female athletes should aim to consume a source of high quality protein at a dose of 0.32 to 0.38 grams per kilogram as soon after exercise as possible to replenish any exercise induced amino acid oxidative losses and initiate muscle protein remodeling and repair. Okay, that's a lot, but basically that's saying that premenopausal, you know, normal cycle women should have about 25 grams of protein post-workout as soon as possible. Now, all of that science speak sounds quite serious, but it's kind of like the glycogen quote earlier. This does not say that this post-workout protein will add muscle mass or improve performance. It says this post-workout protein is going to initiate protein modeling and repair. Again, my clients, their goal when they come to talk to me isn't, you see, I really want to do better at initially <laughs> initiating protein remodeling. <laughs> you never heard that? <laughs> like I really, <laughs> really been wanting to initiate protein remodeling. Okay, right. Yes, we do need protein remodeling and repair for my clients to get more muscle mass, which is for sure one of their goals or to lean out, of course. But the nuance here, whether or not that happens right after the workout or sometime over the next many hours, doesn't matter in the terms of the goals for weight loss or muscle gain, assuming they're eating the right total quantity of protein in the day. So again, I think this is one of those quotes where it will sound like, oh my gosh, I need this, but then we don't understand how it's probably irrelevant to the goal that we have at hand. Okay, and the second one I want to touch on, this is again from page 408, quote, as close to the end of exercise as possible, peri and postmenopausal athletes should aim for a bolus of high essential amino acids, about six to 10 grams containing protein food or supplement to overcome anabolic resistance, end quote. Now, when we hear anabolic resistance, this doesn't again mean I'm getting more muscle mass. It means what are my MPS rates, my synthesis rates to make more muscle mass? Again, that's not predictive of whether or not you're actually going to add muscle mass. But this statement that we need these six to 10 grams of essential amino acids post-workout did come with two citations. So I was like, great, let me go check those, make sure I'm not missing anything. One of the two citations did not even measure MPS or muscle mass gain. They were looking at caloric intake, which not super relevant to making this recommendation. And the other one just measured MPS. They did not actually measure muscle mass or performance. So show me changes in muscle mass or performance or body comp, I'm interested. Show me interested in MPS rates. And we're looking at part of the whole st story that is relevant to my client's goals. Beginning to wrap this up, maybe entering into a bit of a summary, just to kind of do a little bit of a catch all mm -hmm. to that. I would love to know, you know, this, this, this paper, what we've been talking about, what people ask you about all the time that you talk about occasionally, which is like this belief that, there is a fundamental, I don't know if that's the right word, but a fundamental difference between men and women. And so therefore our approaches mm. to nutrition or fitness or health in general should be specific and tailored toward each one of those genders. Uh, where do you fall on that particular question? And then again, maybe kind of walk us into big picture summary of this paper and of the conversation we've been having. Yeah, it is kind of tricky because I 
do believe, like, from a biology point of view and disease risk point of view and even absolute athletic limit point of view that men and women are different. And we do see trends as well. We see trends that generally women are smaller and generally men can build more muscle mass. And so we can say things like, you know, women have a higher risk of X, right? Or generally men get more calories and generally men are going to be stronger. The problem with those general statements is they will fall apart at the individual level to make recommendations Mm -hmm. because there are some women who are larger, ahem, six feet tall (laughs) over here. There are some women who are more muscular, look at some of the games athletes, more active than some men. And so the breadth and depth of size, muscle mass, activity, and goals within just women Make it such that blanket recommendations don't work any better than blanket recommendations for men and women. Because men also have that same huge breadth and depth that, yeah, we're going to see some trends. Generally, women get fewer calories than men. I'm going to tell you people in my masterclass right now, there are going to be some men who get fewer calories than some of the women. And so this is where I try to really steer people towards, okay, Look at your muscle mass, look at your activity, look at your goals to make your nutrition versus just saying, okay, now I'm perimenopausal and I need one gram per pound. It doesn't cut out so cleanly as that. And also the the interesting, there's a couple interesting things. The first one that I like to bring up is some of the podcasts that we've talked about on the Blue Zone culture. You know, the, the cultures that live very long and have a high quality of life and are still able to move around independently. I mean, what are the chances that when they hit menopause, they were eating one gram per pound of protein? I mean, it's just so removed from reality, right? So that's one thing I like to kind of reality check people with. The other thing that I think is a little bit odd to me is if the belief is that research is lacking for women, which in full disclosure, I do believe that there is less um, women-only research, but this is also a big discussion point in the paper that there's so much research lacking for women. Okay, so assuming this is true, then how do we have all this evidence to make women specific Mm. claims? Like, it's kind of, they're kind of going against each other, right? Even in this paper, where they discuss the existing evidence on protein intakes in female athletes, the existing evidence that we do have that I walked us through, it ends up being more in line with my recommendations than this kind of one gram per pound. So I'm ultimately back to the spot of, well, which is it? When we don't have all this research or we do? And if it is the latter, where is it that shows that these pre and post workout timings or the one gram per pound are necessary for the better muscle mass, better body composition, better performance? Again, particularly for the once a day athletes eating the right total quantity. Send me the pub PubMed studies. <laughs> I'm all ears. But it's just odd to me to say, hey, there's not enough research on women, but yet I have all these really specific claims, which the existing evidence does not support. <laughs> all right. We're going to leave it there. Thanks, everybody out there for listening to the show. AC, thank you for all the work you did in putting that episode together. Thanks, everybody, for your ratings, for your reviews, for sharing the show with your friends. We appreciate it when we see them. So thank you. Keep them coming. AC and I will be back next week for a new episode of The Consistency Project podcast.